He is risen, tell it out with joyful voice. He has burst his three-day prison, let the whole world thrill rejoice. Death is conquered, we are free. Christ has won the victory. Come, you say.
Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. Mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory. And the justice of righteousness. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord is triumphed. I shall not die.
according to said garment. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Who said to them, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they lay him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement that seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded to them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterwards, Jesus himself sent out through them from the east to the west, sacred and empirical proclamation of eternal salvation. The gospel of the Lord. Stone. There may have been a time when they had dreamed that some kind of 
dream, but, but not, now it's too late. Jesus was dead. His feet that had walked on water had been pierced. The hands that had felt the multitudes to heal the blind and touch the lepers had been pierced. The women were coming to place warm walls on a cold body to say a last goodbye to one man who had given reason and meaning to their lives and to so many others. It wasn't hope that led the women up the hill to the tomb. It was simply a duty. It was naked devotion, and they expected nothing in return. It was doing something with no strings attached. After all, what would Jesus do? What could a dead man offer for such service and devotion? The women were climbing up the hillside to, to receive. They were going to the tomb to give. Nothing more, nothing less. But there is no more noble motivation than that, is there? Giving of oneself when you have no expectations of receiving anything in return. That's the very example that they learned from Jesus. That's the same kind of love that he'd model for his disciples when he'd take a towel in the base of the water and wash their feet. But you know, there are times when we all are called to love, expecting nothing in return. Times when we're called to give money to people who will never say thank you or offer to repay it or forgive those who won't forgive you. To come early and stay late when no one notices, and if they do, they don't say anything. What is true discipleship? It's service prompted by duty and devotion. The women knew there was a task to be done. Jesus' body had to be prepared for burial, but Peter hadn't offered to do it. Andrew hadn't volunteered. Where were James and John? Who knew? Where was the adulteress who had been forgiven by Jesus or the lepers who had been healed? I mean, we know there was one who, who came back. What about the others? What about the one that Jesus healed from the blindness with just a touch? You know, we have some women and some men in this church who are like that, and aren't we thankful for them? I wonder if on the way to the tomb they ever stopped to reconsider. What if they looked at each other and shrugged and said, what's the use? What if they just turned around and given up? What if one of them had thrown up their arms in frustration and said, I'm tired of being the only one that cares. Let Matthew do something. Let Nathaniel show some leadership for a change. Let Simon show some of his zeal now. I don't know if those thoughts went through their minds or not. If they were tempted, I'm glad they didn't quit. That would have been so tragic. I can say that because you and I know something they didn't know. We know that God was watching. The women thought they were alone, but they weren't. They thought their journey was unnoticed. They were wrong. God knew he was watching them as they walked up the hill. He counted their every step, and he was smiling at their dedication and thrilled by their devotion. And he had a surprise waiting for them. In Matthew's Gospel, he writes, At that time there was a strong earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, went to the tomb, and rolled the stone away from the entrance. And he sat on the stone. He was shining bright as lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The soldiers guarded the tomb, in shock of fear, became like dead men. Now, Mark, in his writing, doesn't give us that much information. He doesn't tell us that the women were concerned as to how they might get to the tomb, knowing that a big stone would block the way to the entrance. But all Mark then says to us is when they arrived at the tomb, the stone had been rolled away, and they found a young man dressed in white sitting there. And he seemed to have been waiting on them. Now, I discovered something a few years ago while I was reading this account. <clears throat> This morning's event. I've shared it with some people before. This is a story that I've read countless times. I suspect you have. And yet something jumped out at me a few years ago as I was reading that had gone unnoticed before, even with all those previous right readings. Why did the angel go away the stone? I've read that passage so many times. And I've always just assumed that the angel rolled the stone away so that Jesus could come out. Think about that. Did the stone have to be moved in order for Jesus to leave the tomb? Did Jesus need help getting out of the tomb? Was the one who had conquered death so weak that he couldn't push away a rock? If Jesus could later enter a locked room, could he just as easy have left the sealed tomb? 
just never stopped to think about it. Hey, can somebody out there move this stone so I can get out? I don't think so. In fact, the script, scripture gives us the impression that Jesus was already out when the stone was moved. Nowhere in any of the Gospels does it say that the angel moved the stone so that Jesus could come out. So why was the stone moved? What was it the angels had said to the women in Matthew's Gospel? He said, come see where the body was. That's it. That's what I'd always miss. The stone wasn't moved for Jesus, it was moved for the women. It wasn't moved so that Jesus could get out. It was moved so that the women and the others could get in. Mark says the women were alarmed. I suspect alarm might be putting it mildly. Sorely afraid might be a better description. Then maybe one Mary looked at the other and she had that same grin on her face that you've had when the bread of the fish kept coming out of that basket. Something stirred within their hearts and all of a sudden it was okay to dream again. Even with the resurrection story, we have different accounts. The gospel writers concerned the events that took place and the order in which they occurred. But the one thing that each writer is unwavering is oh, that the tomb was empty. The doorway was open. The tomb was empty. Matthew tells us of an earthquake. <clears throat> Mark suggests that the women fled from the tomb uh, in fear after hearing the words of the young man in white. Luke tells us that the women came to the eleven with the story of what had happened and what they'd seen. And John tells us how he and Peter had raced to the tomb to see for themselves what had happened. Then we have some different accounts about when and where Jesus had first appeared to his disciples with the words, peace be with you. How long would it take for all the disciples to see Jesus and believe in the resurrection? Who all did Jesus appear to during that 50 days between the resurrection and his ascension back into heaven to be with the Father? While the details may vary from gospel to gospel, there's one fact that rings true and consistent through each account. The women found the tomb empty. The sun had risen. The sky was bright with morning light because the Son of God had also risen. We're here this morning because the Son of God has overcome death and risen from the grave. It would be so easy to take all this for granted. Most of us have heard all of our lives that Jesus died on the cross and arose from the dead on Easter morning. And I, I suspect that we've all accepted that as a fact without placing a great deal of thought in the matter. You know, one of the most difficult things for a preacher to do is to find a meaningful way to end a sermon. We always want to wrap everything up with a nice bow and at the end of each sermon. We want to pull everything together and present a nice package to the congregation, a message that they can take away and remember. Trouble with many of the stories that we have in the Bible is that they're, they're open ended. The story of the prodigal son is a good example. Jesus didn't end the story by saying that everybody lived happily ever after. We don't know for sure what happened to the older brother who was angry with the return of the younger brother. How'd that work out? We don't know. We don't know whatever happened to the man that, that was held by the Good Samaritan. We don't know what happened to the ten lepers that Jesus healed. I mean, we know one returned, but what about the other man? So sermons are hard to end. And I know that because some of you here this morning have told me before, I, I thought your sermon would never end today. <laughs> but this morning's sermon doesn't have an ending. In fact, this morning's message is just the beginning. Even the gospel writers seem to have a different time, difficult time knowing how to end their own gospels. At the end of Mark's gospel, we read that the woman, women found the tomb empty. They encountered an angel. They fled for fear. And then Mark didn't tell us that the women saw Jesus. The angel told them that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they would go and tell the disciples that Mark didn't tell us if they did or not. Matthew goes almost directly from the resurrection to Jesus' ascension when he gave the great commission to go into all the world, teach, preach, and baptize. Luke tells us about Jesus talking with two men on the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> And he tells of a single encounter that Jesus had with the disciples sometime later. And that's all Luke tells us in his gospel. Luke then goes on in the story of Acts to tell us a bit about the continuing story. But that's not all that glorious. It's a story that begins with the stoning of Stephen, the first part of the church. That's followed by the beheading of James and then the, the 
book of Acts ends with Paul sitting in a prison cell in Rome. Now this morning, John tells the story of Jesus appearing to Mary, who doesn't initially recognize him. And then he sends her to tell the others what she witnessed. <clears throat> Jesus said, it's not over. It's just getting started. Later, he'd ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? And he said, well, then go feed my sheep. Jesus said, this isn't the end. This is just getting started. I've been doing most of the work up to this point. Now it's time for you and the others to continue the task that I've prepared for you. The story wasn't over, and it's still not over. It begins a new day each day. Peter had to go back in the world, but now it's a new world. It was a world where the risen Christ was loose. There was work to be done. Jesus had spent a great deal of time, had spent a great deal of time preparing his disciples for this day. His work on earth had ended. Now it was time for these men and his followers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to continue the story. And that's still the task that you and I have. The story really is an unending story. There is no ending. There's no package. There's no bow. What Jesus is about goes beyond Galilee. It goes beyond Jerusalem. It, it truly does go to the end of the earth, just as he said it would. <clears throat> With Jesus' death, the old world ended. With his resurrection, the new world began. I know <clears throat> after Easter, many people are still look like they did before. They're still suffering in pain and disappointment. But because of the resurrection, there's a sense of what can be and what will be. We can get a preview of the future. We can see God who has the power to triumph over death. And we can cling to the promise that Jesus made to his disciples who said, Lord, I you always, even to the end of time. There's still trouble in the world. The church still struggles. People are still in pain. COVID hadn't gone away. And death still starts each of us. But we've seen the future. And we know that it belongs to God. And we're reminded of the fact each time that we come together as a worshiping family. The Lord is risen. It's a new day. It's a new world. It isn't over. It's just begun. We're just getting started. Jesus still says, follow me. You and me this morning, this could truly be a new beginning. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And God is good.
We pray you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have not done. We have not done to our own heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry if we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways. Glory to Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who is great mercy has promised forgiveness of sin to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Strengthen you in all goodness. And bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. But chiefly are we bound to praise thee for the glorious resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he was the very paschal lamb who was sacrificed for us and had taken away the sins of the world, who by his death had destroyed death, and by his rising to life hath won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Son. to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often you shall drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer to thee. The memorial thy son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us. And of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receive them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy institution and remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and life. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Most humbly beseech thee to grant that for the benefits of thy Son, Jesus Christ, through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all of the benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us as we are him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. By whom with whom and in the, in the unity of the Holy Ghost. All honor and glory be to thee, Almighty Father, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Father.
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Amen. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Amen. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to get our own crumbs under thy table, but thou art saying, Lord, to our feet all of us have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may never more without him. Gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance of Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith. Your thanksgiving.
Almighty and ever living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, the living Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be among you and remain with you always. Good to have everyone here today. Please don't wait till Christmas to come see us again. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.